Good morning, Union Church of Bay Ridge and all who have joined us through the gift of technology. It is so good to be here with you once again in the house of praise and worship. Together, though we may be apart, uh, on this 30th Sunday of Ordinary Time. It's also Reformation Sunday, which the worldwide community of Protestant churches mark every year the final Sunday of October because of its proximity to October 31st, a very famous date in church history, particularly for Protestant believers, uh, because that is the date upon which German reformer Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany, uh, in protest of the church's uh, corruption and the need for reformation which of course became a much bigger movement and swept the world at that time uh, and involved many, many more important players uh, than Martin Luther. But October 31st uh, has that importance in our history. And so uh, happy Reformation Sunday to you as we mark that. Uh, And now let us continue to trust in the bedrock assurances of scripture, just as Martin Luther who knew that God was a mighty fortress. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change. And now let us focus hearts and minds on the worship of our God this day and hear the call to worship today uh, from Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before you formed creation, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn us back to dust. A thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past. You sweep them away. They are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning, but in the evening fades and withers. For all our years come to an end like a sigh. They are soon gone and we fly away. So teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. Turn, O Lord, have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad in all our days. Let us worship God. Now let us hear our prayer of invocation, followed by our hymn of praise.
together. Our scriptures assure us, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us then come before our gracious Lord to confess our sin together. Let us pray. Holy and most merciful God, we humbly come before you to confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. That we have not loved you with our whole heart and soul and strength. We haven't loved our neighbor as ourselves. God of grace, we ask you to forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are. And by your mercy, guide what we shall be. So that we may walk in the way of your will. And do those things which are pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And let's take a moment of silent confession together. And all God's people said together, Amen. Uh, friends, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Uh, God's mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Uh, let us then proclaim together the good news of the gospel. I hope you'll say it right where you are. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, having received such great peace from our God, it is right for us to pass that peace to one another. And so I say to you, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And I hope that you'll share that peace with anyone worshiping with you right now. It's announcement time in our worship, and I have just a few today. Um, uh, I want to give one last reminder that we continue to receive uh, the Presbyterian Church USA's Peace and Global Witness Offering, which supports hands-on mission projects, educational programs, and organizations promoting peacemaking and reconciliation locally and throughout our denomination. And we hope that you'll prayerfully consider how you might give over and above your regular offerings to this uh, special offering, the Peace and Global Witness Offering, uh, in, in the next few weeks as we wrap up our collection of that offer. Uh, Sunday, November 29th, that is our new target date to return to in-person worship at Union Church. Uh, we know that there were some disappointed folks who had hoped it was going to be today. Originally, we had planned that, but Session felt that it was right to wait. Uh, and uh, I continue to believe that was the right decision. Uh, we want to get through these next few weeks monitoring uh, the resurgences in infection that we have seen around Brooklyn and New York City. Um, it's happening in other parts of the country as well. And we want to make sure, as sure as we can, that it doesn't get worse and that it stays stable. Um, so let's mark our calendars. November 29th, it's the first Sunday of Advent, uh, the beginning of the Christian year, and the session felt that would be a good milestone for our return. Uh, and we'll continue to monitor COVID-19 here in New York City, and we'll keep you posted. Uh, on that note, uh, keep an eye out for a congregational survey that we'll be sending out to gauge how you all are feeling about returning to worship and to get your feedback on the health precautions and protocols for being in our space together that we'll be expecting everyone to observe. Um, survey should be coming in the mail this coming week by snail mail uh, with a return envelope in it uh, to the church so that you can just put the completed uh, survey back in that envelope, pop it in the mail. We hope everyone will take just a moment of your time. It should only take a few moments to complete. Uh, and uh, complete it and mail it back to us. As always, remember, I'm your pastor. I'm here for you. Uh, I'm glad to meet you here. Uh, we can do it with masks and socially distancing. Um, if you want to just pray or talk in person. Um, or you can call me. You can do it by phone. Just know I'm available to you, brothers and sisters. Now let's continue in our worship together and turn to the proclamation of God's holy word. Hear now our prayer of illumination.
Amen. Our Old Testament lesson uh, comes today in two parts. The first is from Leviticus 19, uh, verses 15 to 18, and then I'll move us to Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 6. Listen for the word of God. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove yourself, your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. comes to us from the first epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians, 
1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Listen for the word of God. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. You remember our labor and toil, brothers and sisters. We work night and day so that we might not burden any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how pure, upright, and blameless our conduct was toward you believers. And as you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, I'd like to speak to you this morning for a few moments on this thought. Pleasing God, not people. Pray with me. Holy One, be with the words of my mouth. Give words as you need. Move me aside that the people may see you, God. Be with the meditation of all of our hearts this day that you may receive honor and glory and we receive blessing through the proclamation of your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pleasing God, not people. There's a church study I came across a few years back. Uh, for the life of me, I haven't been able to find it since. I wish I'd taken better notes, uh, but it stuck with me. Uh, it was focused on mainline Protestant churches like our Presbyterian denomination and had to do with the typical congregation's response to a new pastor coming. Uh, and uh, to find a way to measure that, they focused on the pastor nominating committee of those churches who call the pastor and present the pastor to the church. And specifically, they found among a significant number of churches that within two years of the pastor's arrival, a third of the members of those nominating committees had left the congregation. Uh, that is to say, consistently it was found that even among the people responsible for bringing the pastor to the congregation, not everyone ended up happy uh, with the choice. And it's a great example of evidence confirming our anecdotal experiences in the church that when a new pastor comes, even if it's ostensibly a good match and people are basically happy with the gal or guy, inevitably some won't be. It's just the way it is. A pastor's role in a congregation is a relationship, and that relationship is not going to work for everyone. Uh, how long the person preaches, what they preach about, how they pray, how they run meetings, their personality, how they socialize at coffee hour, the sound of their voice. It simply can be that they're just different enough from our last pastor. And people can even leave as a result. Uh, indeed, one of the things that can be very difficult for a pastor is that sometimes there's no clear reason why someone takes exception to you. And you just have to suck that up and keep going. Because we believe in the church that pastors and congregations come together because of a call from God first and foremost. It's bigger than us. And that is reflected in our passage today from 1 Thessalonians. Uh, with the Apostle Paul writing to the church he founded in Thessalonica in northern Greece. Um, this document, this letter, I always like to point out, it's the very first known Christian document in history, at least that we know of. And we think it was written around 51 AD, 
Uh, and Thessalonica in Paul's day was a large and important city, a uh, port city, a diverse uh, place culturally and religiously. And we think the church reflected that diversity. And it seems that the believers in Thessalonica were anxious and uncertain over a number of things, including disagreements over what they were supposed to believe about when Jesus was coming back and what was going to happen to them in the afterlife. And, and there was anxiety and uncertainty, and those things tend to cause what? Well, there's typically two reactions, either obsessiveness over the issue or the opposite, complete apathy about it. And word had come back to Paul that some of the church members were consumed with worry about their lives and, and these theological questions. And still others had just checked out, so to speak, stopped working and contributing to the community, maybe believing Jesus was about to come back, right? They were, they were all, though, it seems, feeling pretty frazzled and worn out and, and were looking for some leadership from Paul, but he couldn't be there because of his other responsibilities. So Paul is trying to address these matters in our letter. And of course, to do that, to be pastoral to them, he needs to reassert his authority with them as their pastor, right? And he takes a moment in our passage today to remind them of how their relationship started when he and his co-workers first came and started preaching, and teaching, and establishing the church. Specifically, what was compelling to me as I prepared this week was verse 4. Paul says, just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so, we speak not to please human beings, but to please God, who tests our heart. As God is our witness, he continues, we never sought praise from mortals, is what it says in the text, if you remember, but I'm going to use human beings, right? We never sought praise from human beings. Church leadership cannot be about just the matter of seeking the people's approval. It cannot be just about popularity with the people you serve. And this gets tricky because uh, the fact that some people inevitably leave when a new pastor comes, that's true in 1,000 member churches, and it's just as true in 40 member churches. So it's not that big a deal if 10 families leave in a 1,000 member church, whereas in a 40 member church, if just a couple, one or two or three leave, it's noticeable. So it's crucial that everyone understand what Paul's driving at here. A pastor serves a given congregation. Your pastor serves you inevitably for no other reason in the end than to please God. First and foremost, not to please human beings, people. And that means not to please you. Inevitably, what a pastor is supposed to be doing is seeking God's approval, not yours. And I want to push this a little farther and assert it's, this is not just true about pastors. It should be true for any disciple of Jesus Christ, that we should be putting God first, trying to please God first. So our scripture is a great remedial lesson for us 2,000 years on in the church of how we ought to think about our relationships in church, uh, even now. Uh, our, our relationships pastor to congregation or the congregation with one another. And I love how Paul talks here about sharing his own self with the Thessalonians. I think that's a good place to start. In my view, when Paul says he shared his own self, that's Paul's first century version of our modern saying, I kept it real with you all, right? He shared his real self. And friends, I think that's so important for all of us, especially pastors, to do with one another. Um, I've got colleagues whom I respect and admire, but whom I like to call used car salesmen, pastors. Okay. They're always on stage, always glad-handing people, always with a smile and a joke always saying just the right thing. And so you begin to wonder, what is it that they're selling? Because it doesn't seem exactly real. Um, and then there are 
uh, the stained glass pastors, super polished, right? always calm and measured with that formal lilting voice of a Robert Schuller type, right? Or your local funeral home director. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with this. I, I respect these colleagues again, but I ask, is, is that what you're really like? Um, and that ain't me. Uh, I probably don't have to tell you that, right? I believe it's best just to be real uh, with all of my high energy, uh, temperamental, unpolished humanness. Uh, because that's where people connect on our humanness, right? And my deep concern for honesty and transparency, clear communication, right? I wouldn't do it any other way because we speak, we act not to please human beings, but to please God. And this is relevant for us because, and I think most people know this at this point, but it needs to be said because it's so relevant to the scripture before us today. Um, but there are, by my reckoning, about three people who have decided no longer to attend Union Church, um, in their own words, uh, specifically because of me. That's just the reality of things. And I can just hear some of my pastor colleagues, Andrew, what are you doing? Why would you bring that up in a sermon of all places? It could reflect negatively on you, or you could even offend somebody. But friends, that's just the problem, right? Those are the used car sales. I don't have anything to sell you. Um, I just care about pleasing God so that we all can glorify God together. And in part, that means telling the truth with one another. And it means respecting you, whom God loves, uh, enough to tell you the truth, right? Uh, I assume you're spiritually mature and you can deal with the truth. And the truth is, in one of those situations, the member, I think, already had a conflicted relationship here or there, and there may have been other factors, but what was said to me out loud was that offense had been taken at my preachings on Donald Trump, which, of course, I continue to believe is simply truth-telling, truth-telling of the gospel, and my not being afraid as a preacher to call out his wretched idolatries and wrongdoing. But you have to take people where they are and love them. So you accept that someone can't hear what you're preaching. As I always say to the church, you have to go where you're fed. I pray in my church that that's here. Right? But I may not be able to feed everybody in the way they need. Right? In another case of someone leaving, it, it wasn't ever really clear to me what I had done to generate the level of discomfort and even anger that I was uh, experiencing uh, and that led to that departure from our church. There was a laundry list of objections shared with me, but as I pondered that list, and, and I did prayerfully ponder it and brought in others, leaders in the church to help me, uh, it was never clear to me what I could have done differently because it was about who I was. Others who witnessed some of the conflict themselves uh, other leaders uh, said to me, I don't understand what happened there, Pastor. Right? And in the end, I was pretty sure there was other stuff going on than just me that, that they might not even have understood themselves. Right? And just like you, friends, I can't not be who I am. I have to be who God calls me to be, as do you. So, so this stuff is complicated, right? And while no one deserves mistreatment or even abuse, and you do have to stand up against that, still you have to take people where they are and love them. Right? It's how churches stay together. It's how people stay together in churches. Uh, and this balance in how we are with each other uh, is in fact exactly what Paul's talking about in our scripture passage. He tells the Thessalonians, on one hand, we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much, you became so dear to us. It's almost disarming to hear Paul speaking with such sensitivity and gentleness, right? And again, this isn't just about pastors. All Christian brothers and sisters should learn and nurture and practice this loving attitude toward one another. 
This is what Christian love looks like. At the same time, Paul reminds the Thessalonians that he was also like a father dealing with his own children, urging them to live lives worthy of God, which is another way of saying exhorting or correcting people to live right, right? to deal with morality, uh, Christian morality and ethical Christian living, to confront behavior and attitudes that aren't Christ-like or even correct them when necessary which can result in stepping on toes and offending people's sensibilities or sensitivities. Um, But what is it about folks in the end? Once again, it's about pleasing God, not people. And while this responsibility falls on all of us, brothers and sisters in Christ, with one another, uh, it's unavoidable for pastors, right? To be a spiritual guide is part of the job. And just as I have a responsibility to assure you of God's amazing love and grace for you, I have to call out human idolatries and help us all be honest about the human propensity to sin as well. That's part of the job too. And preaching is a major part of that. And I have to tell you, through the years, it's always been encouraging and a relief, really, to hear when brothers and sisters tell me what they expect from their pastor as a preacher is to be challenged every week in some way by the sermon. Not to be entertained, not to be told cute jokes and folksy stories so that you can feel good. Although all of us preachers are striving to make it appealing and enjoyable at least, but the point is to be challenged by God's word and the proclamation of it to think critically about scripture and theology and Christian faith and its intersection with our day-to-day lives in the world, about how the gospel engages and confronts politics and social issues. Because there are a lot of folks out there who falsely believe this idea, it has to be said, preaching is not supposed to make you feel good. I mean, for the love of God, That's what Jimmy Fallon and Trevor Noah and Saturday Night Live and Chris Rock are for, right? Preachers who approach their sermon writing with the intention to make their hearers feel good are bailing on and avoiding the underlying point of preaching to proclaim the whole word of God and specifically the gospel of Jesus Christ against human idolatry, which means we have to challenge and exhort. Yes, preaching is always also to reassure the people of God's extravagant love for you and your redemption in Christ. But knowing that that grace demands repentance and change, right? Sometimes that makes us feel good and sometimes it's really challenging. We can't come to worship to be entertained, to be anesthetized as with a drug, to have our own viewpoints simply affirmed and regurgitated back to us from the pulpit especially, that's not what worship is about. It's not what Christian faith is about. If pastors and preachers and the leadership of the church in general are doing their job, they are going to say things at times that will challenge and offend. Again, there are lots of other places that are about making you feel good but have nothing to do with proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if a church isn't doing something at worship or in our activities through the week uh, that can't also be done at the pool or the gym or the social services office or in your book group or the guys who get together for breakfast every Thursday or by streaming your favorite TV show to have a laugh, then what's the point of our being here? I mean, when people come through the doors of any given church or come through the virtual doors now, they need to see that the church is doing something different than all those other places where good things are also being done. And that difference is Jesus Christ. If we aren't doing something that is uniquely Christ-centered and about the will and work of God and the gospel, then for God's sake, let's just stay home. Our lives were bought with a price because of God's great love for us. And that price was Jesus' death on the cross. And our response should be to lead a life worthy of that sacrifice for you and for me. 
and make a commitment, be willing to be changed and transformed and made new for God's sake, because we seek to please God, not people, as Paul reminds us. And yet, in the end, in seeking to please God, who so deeply loves all of her children and became one of us in Jesus Christ to teach us to love each other as we love ourselves, does it not follow then that pleasing God inevitably means seeking to please one another as well, whom God loves so much? I think this is why Paul, so keen to keep pointing out that he's all about pleasing God, nevertheless keeps talking to the Thessalonians in such kind and gentle and loving terms. So deeply do we care for you. You're very dear to us. We're pure and upright and blameless towards you, Paul says. And that should be our ethic, the way we relate to one another. So let us be gentle with ourselves and be gentle with one another. No, don't make excuses or try to cover up bad behavior when we do wrong. We need to be courageous and mature in keeping each other accountable before Christ because we're seeking to please God. And if love doesn't include a little tough love sometimes, it probably isn't real love. But still, let's be kind and patient and forgiving and merciful with each other. All of that together helps all of us to grow and be strengthened in our faith and to deepen our discipleship and to be transformed more and more into the image of our Lord. And so in the end, we find this is really a sacred circle. Seeking to please God, not people, moves us to extravagant love for other people and to please one another, which in turn pleases God. In the end, pleasing God first leads us to blessing for everyone. Amen. Won't you pray with me, please? Our gracious, loving, redeeming Creator, our mighty God, Mother, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise and thank you for our, that love. And we commit ourselves anew, each of us, to our faith in you, to our commitment to you, to strive to please you, God, first, knowing that all else will follow. Help us to commit our way to that of your way. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And now let us hear our hymn of response. Amen.
brothers and sisters, it's uh, that time in our service for offering. And as we're worshiping virtually, we just want to take this moment to encourage you to stay faithful in your giving, to support the ministry and mission of Union Church. We want to thank all those who've continued to mail those in or bring them in. Um, feel free to do so. Continue mailing them or contact us. Nishani in the office or call me directly and make sure someone's here so if you'd like to bring it in person we can be here to meet you. We're glad to do that. Uh, let's take a few breaths and uh, invite the Spirit in as we go to our awesome God in prayer. Uh, and let me just lift up uh, one prayer concern that um, our church administrator and the director of the playgroup, um, Nishani Pierre Lewis, uh, lost her uncle, Peter Johnson, uh, unexpectedly back on October 7th. Uh, he was just 59 years old, and it was, uh, it's rough for the whole family, uh, particularly his mom, Barbara Johnson, um, and uh, his sister, Tia Johnson, who is Nishani's mom, and the entire family. And uh, so we lift them up, especially in prayer today, uh, as we go to our God together. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting Creator, God, Mother, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we lift our praise to you this day and give you thanks. Alleluia, God, we pray. For the gift of life, we praise you. For breath in our lungs, we praise you. And another day to live in your grace, we praise and thank you, Lord. In nine days, God, our nation will mark the completion of our presidential election cycle, and we pray for our nation. So many of us understand, Lord, and we lay at your feet the weight of this election in determining our direction and our values as a nation, as a society. And we ask that you inspire all who can to vote, and we seek your guidance and wisdom in that vote in the days that are left. We ask you to cast down the corrupt and the selfish and the greedy and the vile and the violent. Deliver us from them, Lord, and instill in human hearts across our nation the will and desire to stand for what is right and just and moral, to reach across the divisions and decide our leadership based not on selfish or fearful notions of self-interest and tribalism, but on the yearning for the greatest opportunity and the pursuit of the greatest justice and the practice of the most earnest goodwill for the most possible, we pray. O oh God, our divine physician, we continue our prayers that you reach into this world with your almighty power and help us to contain the COVID-19 virus. Lord, we pray for your healing for those who are sick. Lord, especially for Native American, black and Latino communities disproportionately affected by this virus. Lord, be with those who have lost, in some cases, many members of their family. Lord, comfort. And we pray you extend your healing power to the Midwest and other places here, even in New York, where the virus has seen resurgence. Guide our health and governing authorities to work to the gifts of science and technology to allow us to bring this virus under control and to find a vaccine that we may return more and more to some kind of normality. Lord, and watch over and protect and guard the health of those who are first-line responders and their families, including those in our own congregation. Lord, we continue to pray, God of justice, that you act through the movements for racial justice across our land with the result that minds and hearts and systems within law enforcement and among governing officials will be transformed. That a will to consider the humanness of all who come under law enforcement's power, that that willingness will sweep across our police departments at all levels in our nation along with just and necessary changes in their practices to eliminate racial bias and reduce violence. And we continue to pray without ceasing that you bring justice in the prosecution of those responsible for the lynchings of George Floyd in Minneapolis 
Ahmad Arbery in Georgia, Elijah McLean in Aurora, Colorado, and then the unwarranted deaths of, in Louisville of David McAtee and Breonna Taylor, thus far denied justice. We still pray for it, Lord. Let it be as well as for Manuel Ellis in Tacoma. And we pray also for continued healing and wholeness for police shooting victim Jacob Blake in Kenosha. And Lord, we ask that you act in all circumstances, too many to name, where innocent and unarmed people of color continue to experience disproportionate injury and death, whether by law enforcement or fellow citizens. Lord, we also ask that you stem the harassment and even violence experienced by our Asian fellow citizens because of bigotry during the pandemic. Lord, watch over, protect and sustain and heal them as well. Lord, we're mindful of your creation, God, of the drought throughout a large portion of our nation, Southwest and West. And we honor your creation's natural courses, O oh God, but we need your help to adjust and your forgiveness and redemption from what our human errors have contributed to climate change. So we pray first and foremost for those suffering loss in the wake of the devastation of wildfires on our west coast and from the continual tropical storms this year along our southern and eastern coasts and floods in the Midwest and drought elsewhere. We pray, O oh Lord, you bring relief to your creation, that you be with us until the storms are stemmed, as are the waters, and that you extinguish the flames and the embers, and we ask you to comfort those who have lost loved ones, sustain so many who have lost homes and possessions and been displaced. Sustain and strengthen all those working tirelessly extra hours to extinguish the fires and provide recovery and relief from the storms. Lord, give your creation peace, we pray. And help us in the human family to bear up and be willing to make the changes we need to make to reduce our harm to the earth. We lift to you the needs of our congregation now, Lord. And we lift up the extended family of Peter Johnson. We lift up Barbara and Tia and Nishani and the whole family. Be a wonderful counselor and a comfort, Lord, in this time of grief. And we pray that for all who are grieving loved ones. Those in grief know there's no time frame for it. There are some who are grieving those gone years. And we pray that you be a presence that is comforting and sustaining God. Lord, we continue to pray for all of those recovering physically from surgery and injury, and those contending with chronic pain, Lord. We pray that you comfort. We pray that you heal. We pray that you give strength and a sense of your accompanying presence with them. Be with those contending with mental illness within their families, uh, those contending with addiction in our midst. We ask that you place the right people and programs amongst them to bring stability. Lord, we pray that you be with all of those who are hurting and broken in relationships. Lord, we pray that you be that wonderful counselor to those who need reconciliation. Touch and transform our lives and our relationships with forgiveness and trust and healing. We pray. We ask it all in the name of Jesus who taught us to say together, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. Our charge today is very simple. Go from where you are worshiping with the intention to please God and not people. To please God first and foremost. And I believe we all will find that if we put God's pleasure and God's will, and God's desire for our good first, we will find a sacred circle that leads us to other people in love. For God 
loves us all and wants what is good for us. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Creator, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.